avoidant restrictive food intake disorder or ARFID, ARFID. Well, this disorder is essentially another feeding disorder. It's another description really for feeding disorders. The basic criteria, we're gonna go over that in a second, really has no age limit or um, early onset. It's more that it is now in the category of eating disorders in the DSM-5. And I think that's what makes it very confusing. First of all, the DSM-5 is something that we think about more from, oh gosh, a psychosocial point of view. It's, it's often where we look into mental health issues, et cetera. And so because of that, in most states, not all, in most states, the professionals who can diagnose avoidant restrictive food intake disorder are actually social workers, psychologists, or sometimes psychiatrists, because they are the one who use the DSM-5. But a speech pathologist like myself can certainly contribute information around that child's psychosocial functioning when it comes to food. But first of all, let's just kind of go over in brief the criteria. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll also post two slides from my course on pediatric feeding disorders and anxiety that I have on my website at melaniepotok.com. And that will list the criteria for you straight out of the DSM-5, and you're more than welcome to take those slides with you. Just do me a favor and keep my copyright on them, okay? All right, so let's talk about ARFID. It is an eating or feeding disturbance, yes, under eating disorders, but it has nothing to do with anorexia or bulimia. It has nothing to do with body image. So let's separate that for a second. Examples that I can give you when it comes to a feeding disturbance is that it could be an apparent lack of interest in eating or in food. That could be so many of our clients in feeding therapy. It's also an avoidance based on the sensory characteristics of food. It could be that. So many of our clients, right? But it's also a concern about aversive consequences that may occur after eating or during eating. In other words, I might choke or um, it might taste really bad. A lot of our kids experience that. It's manifested by persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional and or energy needs associated with one of the following four things. So they only have to have one. The first one is significant weight loss or failure to achieve expected weight gain or growth, okay? The second one is a significant nutritional deficiency. The third one is a dependence on enteral feeding or oral nutritional supplements like a drink like Pediasure, for example, that we see all the time, but the kids have to have that a lot frequently in order to grow. That would qualify under ARFID. The fourth is a marked interference with psychosocial functioning, a marked interference with psychosocial functioning. And to me, that's the one, especially for my kids who are a little bit older, that third grade and up, that I see really impacting them. So we're going to focus a lot on that in just a minute. Okay, the other thing to know is that this disturbance, this feeding disturbance, is not better explained by a lack of available food or associated with a culturally sanctioned practice, so we can rule that out. Also, the eating disturbance does not occur exclusively during anorexia or bulimia. We've always already talked about that, so we can rule that out. And the eating disturbance is, attributable, is not attributable to a concurrent medical condition. Let's take a look at that. If you've ever watched my Mondays with Coach Mel before, you've ever been to any of my courses, probably every single course I teach, I start by talking about my stacking model. And I know many of you heard me talk about this before, so I'm going to be pretty quick here, but I just want to make sure new listeners understand. Whenever a family says to me, how did I end up with a kid who can't eat like more than three foods? How did this happen? Well, I want you to imagine three blocks stacked on top of each other. That first block, that's physiology. That's how your body functions. And just by going through the criteria for ARFID, 
we just took a look at several different possibilities where physiology or how your body functions might go awry, right? Well, I have a lot of kids on my caseload who have avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, but it started from a peanut allergy. It started because they were severe picky eaters when they were little and they never grew out of it. Um, it started from a choking episode. I have a little kiddo like that who choked on a peppermint when he was in the car seat. And here we are four years later, still scared to eat new foods. The other thing we wanna consider is not only that physiology stack that we just talked about, and that's going to include emotions and anxiety and sensory processing, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the physiology of our whole body. The second block are motor skills. Well, think about my little pumpkin right now who choked on a peppermint, and now that kiddo only eats like four foods and they're all soft, squishable foods. He has really weak musculature in his um, around his jaw especially but throughout his face because he never got the crunchy foods that we need to build those muscles so i've got some oral motor work to work on with that little kiddo but he's still 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 excuse me scared to death to try new food finally that brings us to the third block or the roof on the building i will say and those are learned behaviors those are the behaviors that kids do in order to protect their body from one of the other issues like physiology, sensory uh, sensitivities, et cetera, et cetera, that make them feel so uncomfortable. But let's say that those issues, like my little client who has a severe peanut allergy are resolved. You know, she hasn't been exposed to peanut in years. She's never had a reaction since then because she's not around peanuts. So how come she doesn't wanna try new foods? Well, it's because of that marked interference with psychosocial functioning. So that's what we're gonna focus on for the next few minutes, okay? What we're talking about there is the A word in avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. We're talking about avoidance, avoidance. So when these kids just try their very best to avoid certain foods, it doesn't mean that they don't really want to learn to like new foods. They would love to be able to eat something other than just pizza crust at the local slumber party, right? The neighborhood slumber party, they're ordering all this pizza and these poor little kids are like, well, I'll eat the crust and that's all they'll, they'll eat. They genuinely want to be able to eat pizza, but they're just too anxious to do so and they don't know the steps to go about it. And that's where feeding therapy comes in. Okay, so if this child is, the one issue is this interference with psychosocial functioning, right? Where they, they can't go out and about, they can't go to the prom because they only eat chicken nuggets because they can't go to a fancy dinner. Um, they only eat one meal at school. They can't go on uh, a lot of field trips because maybe they aren't allowed that food on the field trip or maybe everyone's gonna be eating out and you can't bring that food with you. They can't get together with friends because they're scared that the friend's mom and dad might offer food that they can't eat and they're too embarrassed to admit that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see where these kids, it really starts to impact their social life and their psychosocial functioning. Well, the thing is, what they still do is avoid, 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 avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And they avoid because of this high level of anxiety they have around food. So what I always say is that having avoidant restrictive food intake, intake disorder is a lot like desperately wanting to learn to swim, but avoiding water at all costs, right? Yeah, desperately wanting to swim, but avoiding water at all costs. So our job in feeding therapy is not only to address those three stacks that we talked about and make sure that we get everything as normalized, we say, as possible, but also to help that child learn to trust us and have the confidence to go through very subtle baby steps to learn to try a bunch of new foods. But the piece that's often missing is these children also need support from a social worker or a psychologist, or if you've taken my course taught by Dr. Jonathan Dalton, 
who is one of the leading experts in pediatric anxiety, what he says in that course with me is it needs to be someone who's trained and utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy, because that is the one method that has the research behind it that shows that we can help these kids. So not only can they be in feeding therapy, because we know how to teach kids the process of eating and how to build confidence and chain foods together, a psychologist doesn't necessarily know how to do that, but a psychologist can work on the anxiety piece. And in my personal opinion and professional, just from years of doing this, almost all of my kids diagnosed with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder who are like second grade and up also have an anxiety disorder, also have an anxiety disorder. And that's just based on my experience. I don't have any research behind that. It's what I've been seeing for years and I feel very comfortable sharing that with you. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit more and then I'll be taking your questions. So remember, there's no specific age. You could have a two-year-old with ARFID, but we most often see this diagnosis a little bit more like the school age group. It, the most important thing to focus on and for this discussion tonight is psychosocial functioning and that avoidance, that avoidance. Now, what I often see is that the kids start to get better. And we start to get, oh, I don't know, five, 10, maybe 15 new foods in place. And then without fail, they dig in their heels. And you know why they do that? Because they realize they're getting better. And getting better is not where their comfort zone is. Their whole life has been about being an extreme picky eater and being stuck in this little box. And feeding therapy is making the box a little bigger and a little bigger. And they're having to put one foot outside the box, right? That is really scary. Now they're out of their safe zone. So when they begin to realize that they're capable and that they are gonna eat new foods and darn it, they actually like these foods, that is frightening for these kids. So don't worry when you see them dig in their heels and you think, oh my gosh, this isn't working. No, 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 that's a sign that it's actually working. And they're just gonna need a gentle push to keep going, a gentle push to keep going.